Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Science Friday live stream of the Mars 2020 landing that is happening in just under an hour. Thank you so much for being here. There are so many ways that you could be watching the NASA live stream, and we are so excited that you are here with us as part of our breakthrough series. Um, this is part of the Breakthrough Festival, so um, we are celebrating women in science and in STEM over the last few days and into the weekend. So if you want to join us for some additional events that we have going on, you can always do that. Uh, you can find out more information about that on our website at sciencefriday.com slash Breakthrough Festival. That is a great place to find out all the information about basically anything that Science Friday does. Um, again, thank you so much for being here. We're so excited. Um, 500 Women Scientists also has been helping us produce this festival. So um, if you want to follow their work, you can do that by going on Twitter or Instagram. 500 Women Sci is a great place to do that. Uh, they have been amazing supporters of women in STEM, but also of this festival. And we're so happy to have them as partners. Okay, so um, we are gonna start watching the live stream soon, but I wanna introduce the experts who are here to give us a little bit of background about their work, as well as their experience. And while we watch the live stream together, we can talk with them a little bit about the things they know about not just Mars, but also space in general, astrophysics, all kinds of stuff. So I'm super excited. Um, first, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Buchin Mutlu-Pakdil. Uh, she is a astrophysicist and astronomer, and she's currently working as an NSF and KICP postdoctoral fellow at the University of Chicago. Hi, Buchin, welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me. And uh, I, uh, as you said, I am an astronomer and I use uh, observations, uh, images from uh, amazing telescopes uh, to understand galaxies and how they form, how they are evolving. We, uh, two, three years ago, we discovered an extremely rare galaxy uh, now commonly referred to as Puchin galaxy, but now I am also searching for faintest and smallest galaxies around the Milky Way, and they might be the key to our understanding of nature of dark matter. That is so cool. I'm so excited to ask you more questions about that soon, and also hopefully our audience will have some questions for you too. Amazing. Well, our second guest for today is Mora Baja. He is a space environmentalist and an associate professor of aerospace engineering and engineering mechanics at the University of Texas in Austin. Hi, Morba. How are you? Good. How about yourself? Doing great. Tell us a little bit more about the work that you do. Yeah. So um, here at UT Austin, uh, I lead a transdisciplinary research program in space safety, security, and sustainability. And really what that means is I'm trying to understand the population of, of Earth orbiting objects, space debris, junk, and, and satellites, and try to help out with uh, navigating our current space traffic problem. But uh, back in the day, I used to be a spacecraft navigator at JPL, so I'm familiar with uh, these these kind of moments of, of getting to Mars and stuff, so I'm really looking forward to this. Amazing. Thank you so much again for being here with us. It's going to be really great to ask you some questions. I have a lot of questions. So, uh, okay. And our last expert is Shannon Sterone. She is a writer based in San Francisco, California, who focuses on all things space and astronomy, but also here and there, a lot of other science stuff. Hey, Shannon. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah. What are you excited to have written in the last, let's say six months or so? Like what, what has been really cool for you to find out more about and write? Uh, the last six months would definitely be the phosphine, the possible phosphine detection on in the clouds of Venus. Um, so the implications for that, if it is phosphine, is something very mm. weird happening on that planet. So that's that's been the most fun to report on. Very contentious yeah. and fun. Yes, I remember that. Well, how was that in the summer that we heard that news and people started talking about? Is it life? Is it not? Mm -hmm, September. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Um, all right, well, I'm gonna actually turn on the live stream from Mars, uh, from NASA actually, who are watching everything happen on Mars um, and see what's going on. So um, let's sit back and enjoy the show just for a little bit. What the wheels of the rover are made out of? Great question. Well, you may think we make them out of some material you've never heard of. It turns out they're made of aluminum. Now, Perseverance's wheels are a little thicker than Curiosity's, but they're actually both made out of aluminum. And one more question for you. Can you tell us more about the importance of where you are right now in the building? 
Yes, I am above on the second floor, above the cruise mission support area that you've been watching. And this is the surface mission support area. So as soon as Perseverance lands, all commands, all, ta all this, this room will take over, it will become headquarters for operating Perseverance on Mars. Thanks for taking the time to talk to us today, Jennifer. Thank you. Now, we now know Perseverance's place in history. Let's take an up close look at the rover with Mars 2020 system testbed engineer, Helio Morillo. Thank you, Raquel. I'm standing in front of the Mars 2020 Perseverance scaled model. As you can tell, this vehicle is about the size of a Mini Cooper. These wheels are obviously black here and they look like rubber, but they're actually fully made of metal. These wheels are designed to allow us to climb over obstacles and of course climb over hills and minimize the amount of slipping once we're traversing on the surface of Mars. Here in the front of the rover, we have the sample caching system. And of course, the very front end of this is the robotic arm, which this entire system is arguably the most complex robotic system we've ever sent outside of Earth. Here at the tip of the arm, we have a turret which contains a suite of instruments along with some drills and coring capabilities that will allow us to do contact science once we get to the surface of Mars. Not only that, this robotic system is equipped to collect samples about the size of a piece of chalk that then eventually will be stored inside of the vehicle and dropped off in a later location so that an eventual mission can go and return these samples to Earth, something we've never done in the past. Here in the front, we have the remote sensing mast. Something of note is that this mechanism is going to be stowed upon the touchdown on the surface of Mars. And one of the first critical activities we do is deploy this mechanism. This mechanism includes several cameras that are going to give us some of the most breathtaking images we've ever taken on Mars. Along with that, we have some lasers as well as a spectrometer. They're going to allow us to do some remote science. Here you see some of these extrusions that are part of a larger weather suite of instruments that will allow us to characterize the local climate around Perseverance. So that's a quick tour of the rover, but I gotta get back to work. So back to you. <laughs> you are muted. <laughs> Thank you. The, the phrase of 2020 and 2021, yeah. am I right? Um, I want to take a quick break from the live stream just to ask you all some questions. Um, Shannon, I know that you saw this rover in real life just like what, a year or two ago? There's a picture of you standing in front of it. What was it like mm -hmm. to be standing with this rover? It was incredible. I saw it just uh, about two weeks before they packed it up and shipped it to Cape Canaveral. Um, it, you know, you can kind of prepare for something like that. Like this is going to be really cool and, you know, get dressed up in a bunny suit. But I didn't realize how big the rover was. Mm. And I think a lot of people make those same comments. Like this is a huge machine. It really is. It's so big that it has its own presence. It feels like, okay. Um, it was amazing. It was incredible being in the same room with something that was going to be landing on Mars and looking for evidence of life. And knowing that I was lucky enough to be one of the few people on this planet to stand in the same room with that instrument is, I'm, it's an amazing moment. It's yeah. It's so cool. I can only imagine. I have never, the only thing I've ever seen is the, um, in the natural, national space museum that's in dc they have mm -hmm. a replica of one of the landers and it is very cool but it's not the same thing so it's it must have been so cool to know like that thing is going to be on mars in just a couple months yeah and they had like the rover in the center and uh sky crane and the capsule so like all the different parts that are going to break off from the rover it was the entire package for us to see it was it was absolutely amazing very cool. Um, Buchan, I would love to ask you a little bit about the science that you do. So you do science that's a little bit different from some of the other people who might be you know, talking about space today. So um, less planetary science and more um, like astrophysics and like looking at the stars. Um, what is it like to do the work that you do every day? Are you looking at computer screens? Are you looking through telescopes? Tell us a little bit about that. 
Yeah, actually, this is a ni very nice question because one of the common misconceptions about my work is that people generally assume that I have my own telescope and I carry this around and take it to the mountain and stay up all night and stare at the sky and try to <laughs> discover things with my own eye. But in fact, um, I have very fairly, uh, I don't, I don't own a telescope i use telescope uh, large telescopes that are really uh, competitive to access as four meter six meter eight meter telescopes and i also use hubble space telescope uh, and i for to be able to uh, observe with these large telescopes, you need to first prove that your idea, your science case is really interesting, really important, and you compete with the other scientists. Uh, so you will be selected and then you will get the time on the telescope and take the observations. And sometimes you, for example, for a year, you uh, prepare your for your prepare yourself for taking that time. And during the observation, clouds can come and all the observation can go on and uh, you will just wait for another year to get that data. And when I uh, get the data, most of the things I do with the computer, uh, staring at uh, computer, writing codes and like debugging things, plotting things and uh, trying to find the mysteries of the universe, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It, it must be one of the things I think about a lot in science is how often we rely on the work that other people have done 10, 50, 100, uh, you know, thousands of years ago and, and the knowledge that those people had. Um, and it must feel like that sometimes for you too. It's like, oh, if someone had just pointed a telescope in that direction. Um, it probably feels like it, maybe we wouldn't have gotten the data right because our, our instruments are so much better than they were probably even like 10 years ago, right? Definitely, definitely. Especially like right now, the, the work that I am doing for example, the uh, the search for the faint and uh, small galaxies, these the, their existence were not known until ten years ago. The, we with the better uh, sky coverage, better uh, imaging, now we we can detect them, and now we can study them in depth. Yeah, very cool. Um, we're going to go back to the stream for a little bit and then more, but I have some questions for you. And we also have some great questions coming in through the comments. So if you are joining us on Facebook, on YouTube, or on Twitter, you can feel free to put your questions in the comments and we will check them out and get to them. Uh, but like I said, we're going to check out the live stream again right. and see what's going on at NASA. The generation that's going to actually get to work with these samples when when they come back you will be the scientists and engineers that will will be the the next generation to to change how we think about uh, about mars and how we think about life in the solar system that was a great question Lori. reach for the stars future little scientists and engineers thank you so much for joining us here today Lori. it's my pleasure thanks back to you raquel for another mission update Thanks, Marina. The cruise team for Perseverance controls the rover on its way to Mars. And moments ago, they handed it over to the landing team. And it looks like team leaders in mission control are about to talk to both teams. So let's listen in. Uh, the CBM change, uh, as I mentioned previously, is to the EDL reserve to a non-coherent row. Activity. Copy flight. EDL phase, go ahead. Okay, I'm like, pep talk, I guess, to the team. All right. Uh, you know, I'm terrible at pep talks. I think you, my reputation precedes me there. And uh, look, I know this hasn't been easy, right? I'm not even sure we've even been in all in the same room at the same time. I mean, I'm staring at folks across the, uh, across the internet as well. Uh, even now, right? Only yeah. Point check. Okay. Um, I do want to just extend uh, my heartfelt appreciation from the EDL team to the, uh, to the launch cruise team. Uh, you've done everything we've asked for, right? I mean, you've battled anomalies, you've you know, dealt with CEFIs, you've done everything. Uh, you delivered a healthy spacecraft uh, to the place that we want to go. Um, and she's right on target, right? You, you did the last maneuver literally two months ago, right? This is pretty incredible, in my opinion. 
Um, and she's on with the right information to help us land. You know, doing the parameter update last night, we're, we're ready to roll. You've done everything right. Um, and you've put up with us too, right? You've put up with our eccentricities and uh, the things we like to do in EDL land. So I very much appreciate that. You are muted again, I guess. Of course I am. I'm so sorry, everyone. <laughs> it takes a lot to, to do, press all the buttons, but thank you. Um, I wanted to just pause for a moment and let, let the stream keep going, but pause their, their sound for a little bit so that I could ask you more about, about um, we're looking at mission control. Do you recognize any of the people or even just the positions that people are in? Yeah, so let me say this. So Alan Chen and I go way back. Um, Alan and I had an internship with Microcosm Incorporated before he uh, before he even graduated from MIT and was still a uh, boyfriend, girlfriend with Julie Wirtz. So back from those days, I remember Alan and uh, yeah, no, known him since like 1999, 1990. Uh-oh. Oh, looks like we lost Morba for a moment. Maybe he'll come on back, but... Yeah, he's speaking about two of the people who grew up in NASA together and um, met on, I believe, on on the mission control floor and um, mm -hmm. have since gotten married. Mm -hmm. um, but we actually have a really great question. Um, I, I wonder if, Shannon, this might be something that you might be able to um, field. Uh, we've got a couple of people asking about microbes okay. um, and tardigrades. How do we keep Mars and other potential planets safe from our microbes? That's a really great question. Um, so NASA works with uh, the Office of Planetary Protection and they are in charge of doing that very thing, making sure that we're not contaminating bodies in the solar system with all of our bacteria and gunk, um, which is actually very hard to do. Mm -hmm. um, and it's actually technically impossible because uh, there's actually a microbe on, um, so one thing to say is that in mission or in the clean rooms at JPL, they wipe down all the spacecraft with um, alcohol and, you know, they do everything they can to clean them down to the wires. Um, there's actually a microbe, a bacteria that lives in JPL's cleanest clean room called SAFR32, S-A-F-R, um, and they can't kill it. It lives in the wires. Um, it's incredibly resistant and um, it's it's not harmful, but there's a, they have to meet a certain protection guideline of we need at least, you know, 99.6% all microbes from Earth to be killed before we can launch something to another planet. So they're very safe, but life is very hardy at the same time. So it's, it's a challenge. Oh, you're muted. I can't hear you. Yeah, it seems like the, the things that usually uh, stick around are the uh, are the tardigrades, right? Like these these incredibly hardy, tiny little microbes and, and almost like animals that um, are the ones that live in our most hostile environments here on Earth. So it makes sense that those would be the things we would expect to see on our spacecrafts and unfortunately left behind if we, uh, if we leave and perhaps uh, thriving. I mean, probably not, but who knows, right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I don't think we have, oh, sorry. No, it's okay. Uh, keep going. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, I don't think we have evidence that we've ever sent a tardigrade to Mars, but the fact that they've survived on the outside of the International Space Station and they can put up with nearly anything, I wouldn't be surprised if they did just fine there. Yeah, absolutely. Morba, I I'd love to bring you back in and just um, ask you a little bit more about, so what's what's happening on the floor right now? What kind of um, uh, feelings do you think some of the mission control people are having at this moment? It's We're, we're getting down to the wire here. I mean, look, um, having been there before with the peanuts and all this other stuff, it's like this is really this is really where a lot of um, the hard work kind of converges. I mean, getting the thing to Mars, like Alan was saying, putting up with their eccentricities in the EDL land. It's like the spacecraft navigators that work all that interplanetary phase don't don't really jive too much with the EDL people. It's like a whole different like subculture at JPL, but. Everybody uh, is definitely into the teamwork. And so the NAV people for sure can't wait to just get this to Mars Atmospheric Interface. And 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 then it's like, she's all yours kind of thing, right? And then, mm -hmm. the, then the EDL team is is really kind of like, uh, you know, white, white knuckling it until uh, 
this, this thing gets to the surface and reports back safely. I think the one way light time right now is just over 11 minutes. Um, so, so there's that. And, mm -hmm. uh, it's just very, it's just very, um, surreal. Uh, I don't, I don't think many people really get that, um, you know, information, information travels across the universe at the speed of light and it just takes time. And, uh, you know, things, things have already happened by the time, you know, the uniform, you know, space time informs you uh, of those events. And so, um, you know, all those things wrapped together, uh, this is definitely a big deal. This is, the, this is the reason why you work these missions are for these sorts of moments for sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, speaking of which, actually, we have a really great question from Facebook. Uh, Eric asks, uh, when did you know that this, the subject that you are working on now was something that you wanted to do and what drew you to the field? Um, Butchard, I'd love to start with you. What, what drew you to astrophysics? For sure. So uh, everything started with a middle school assignment, actually, for me. It was like the assignment was to write a, a essay about your my role model. And I was thinking, who who is my role model? Who I want to be? And then I asked my sister, who is the cleverest person in the world? And my sister said, I don't know, maybe Einstein, check it out. And then I started reading about his life. And instead of his life, the work he did really attracted me. And then I started reading more science journals. And I started to get interested in like black holes, these giant systems that even light cannot escape, time can stop, and space can uh, space is banned. It seems so unreal, and I, I just wanted to know more about them. And that's that's when I said, okay, I will do space, whatever it takes. <laughs> I love it, yeah. Um, and if you want to watch, uh, we actually have featured about a 10 minute video of Buchin and her story of getting started in science and some of the cool things that she's done. Um, and we just put that link in the chat. So if you want to check that out after live stream, uh, that is a great thing to do next. Um, before I move our question actually over to Shannon and Moriba, I want to go back to our live stream and see sort of what's going on over there. Looks like they're featuring some really cool, uh, uh, something that, where is it? Add to stream. There we Thank go. Some so cool artworks that people have Remember, made. Hashtag Countdown to Mars. We love to see how you're celebrating. Now, you might know our next guest from shows like Emily's Wonder Lab. Joining me now is Emily Kellandrelli. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Oh, we love Emily. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Now, you are very passionate about getting kids interested in science and space exploration. Why do you think kids are so excited about space? Well, I know the reason I'm excited about space, and I think it's the same reason that many others are excited about space, and it's that the people in the space industry work to answer two of the biggest questions that humans have ever asked. Are we alone in the universe and where did we all come from? And by sending a rover to Mars, we are gaining evidence for the answers to these questions, more evidence than we ever had before. And I, I think that's so exciting. It is, and I know you get loads of interesting questions from kids. Have you gotten any about Mars specifically? Oh my gosh, yes, <laughs> everybody loves Mars. It's in movies and books and TV shows and everybody loves Mars. So one of the things that I, I get asked a lot is that, you know, it's called the red planet. Why is it red? Well, it's red because it's literally rusty. The top layer of soil on Mars has iron oxide in it or rust and rust has that brownish red color. So it's, it's red because it's rusty. And also because it's red, they ask, is it red hot? Is it really hot on Mars? And well, no, actually, it's colder than the Earth. It's farther away from the sun. So as you would imagine, it's a little bit colder than the Earth. It also has a really thin atmosphere. So the heat that it does have, it has a hard time keeping in. Um, and so it's a little bit colder. But then I also get asked, what would I weigh on Mars? That's a really fun question. So on Mars, it's a little bit smaller than the Earth. So the gravity there is weaker. It's about three eighths the gravity that we have here on Earth. So if you weighed 100 pounds here on Earth, you weigh 38 pounds on Mars or 100 kilograms here on Earth, 38 kilograms on Mars. Those are all super fun. I think even some adults want to know the answers to those questions. Emily. <laughs> <laughs> now, why do you yeah. think it's so important to educate kids about science and give them that great foundation? 
Well, science is the language of nature and learning about science and learning how to think like a scientist means you are learning how to systematically seek out truth in the world. You are learning the scientific method. You're learning how to be a critical thinker. And honestly, those skills are great for whatever you end up wanting to do in life. True. If you want to be a scientist or an opera singer, that holds true. And what are you Agreed. excited about today? So true. I mean, humans are launching a robot to Mars. That doesn't happen every day. I think I love all of the happiness that is going on today and all of the nerves, I just everyone can take a moment to sit back and remember that we live in a time when humans have the ability to send a robot to another planet. And that is just, that's so cool to me. It is very cool, Emily. Take a deep breath. Thanks for joining us here. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Sending it back to you now, Raquel. Thanks, Marina. We are offering lots of ways to ride along with us to Mars. Now put yourself right into the action now. With our <laughs> that's great. Oh, my God. You can post that's that's pretty cool. cool. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, yeah. yeah. All right, I'm going to mute the live stream just for a little bit. Um, this is, I mean, the, the photos are amazing. I think they speak for themselves. Um, Morva, I wanted to ask you, so you, um, you you gave us a little bit of a briefer into the work that you do talking about space junk. So um, I wanted to ask you just to tell us a little bit more about sort of the research that you do and its implications for all kinds of science, but especially as we're sending things into space, I'm wondering, what, do we have to look out for stuff that's in our atmosphere? Yeah, so, I mean, um, you know, one of the things that I kind of fell into once I left JPL and went to work for, like, the Air Force Research Lab was less less focus on Mars, more of, about stuff uh, around the Earth. And it's like I discovered a, a this lost ecosystem uh, in near-Earth orbit. And, um, you know, just like, just like you can't actually see the wind, but you can kind of infer – the wind from, you know, watching leaves and, and, and clouds and that sort of stuff. It's like there's this whole ecosystem that is invisible to people. But as we have been launching more and more stuff into space and most of these things just don't come back, you can kind of see these patterns emerging in near Earth orbit. So it's this invisible ecosystem that that has become more visible uh, with the increase of human activity and sending more, more and more stuff uh, on orbit. So my, my focus uh, is really trying to say, look, um, near Earth space is another ecosystem. It, it's a finite resource. There's only like specific orbital highways where we put satellites and it's in need of environmental protection, just like uh, lands, oceans and that sort of stuff. And much like the ocean, you know, where microplastics will always be around, there's always going to be some uh, remnants of orbital debris in, in near-Earth orbit because things have exploded or collided with each other, nuts and bolts, these sorts of things. And so we just need to be careful. And, and when it comes specifically to exploration and Mars and whatnot, um, I'm, I'm, I'm less of a fan of things like colonization, uh, that the word itself uh, is already brings up negative connotations for mm -hmm. me and lots of other people. And it's like, Look, if we go to Mars right now uh, and and wait for we're you know waiting for Perseverance to land, we'd probably see broken heat shields, uh, parachutes flapping in the Martian wind, and that's just not we shouldn't be we shouldn't be exploring space in the same ways that we've explored other parts of 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 the Earth because the environment has uh, paid a high cost as a consequence of this sort of thing with the in, you know, idea of, oh, well, you know, Mars is big kind of thing. Oh, the ocean is big. Oh, space is big. The, the oh, the blank is big kind of mentality has always been to the detriment of the long-term sustainability of that specific ecosystem. So I think we just need to think a bit more carefully about how we do the exploration. And I think we could do it in a very ecologically sustainable way. Absolutely. And if people want to find out more information about the work that you're doing, where can they do that? Yeah, so I have one uh, one stop shop. It's like flow dot page uh, forward slash morba, and then everything about me is is on that page. Awesome, fantastic, and I will um, post that in the chat as well, so that people can uh, find out more about the work that you're doing. Booyah! <laughs> um, 
so we're going to go back to the stream in just a minute. But actually, um, Buchan, we had a question that I thought you might be able to uh, field a little bit earlier. They asked um, if so. There is this far. There's this object at the end of our solar system called the called far far out. Um, do you know much about this object, and and have you heard of it, and what kind of value does it have in the work that people might be doing, looking out at the end of our galaxy, a little bit closer than than how you look out, right? So definitely, and this is not a this is in, still in solar system. Uh, so and the the objects that I'm studying is totally different than those. Yeah, yeah much are, further, right? Much further and uh, outside of our own galaxy. But uh, of course, uh, this really shows that uh, systems like with uh, better technology with better. Uh, imaging systems, we are getting better at discovering things, the mysterious objects that we had no idea they existed. So it is one of them, but I, I personally, I didn't study it and I, I, uh, I have limited information on it, uh, but uh, definitely each object we discover uh, is very valuable and it's to important uh, puzzle uh, piece in our uh, big puzzle for yeah. sure. Absolutely. Um, all right. Well, I'm going to put the stream up for a little bit longer as well so that um, we can take a look at what's happening on the mission floor. Well, this is the, this is the nail biting time. Um, fortunately, we still have ones and zeros coming, but very soon as we approach through stage separation, the, the transmitter on this rover that we've been using all the way to get to Mars is going to be turned off. Um, so, we're, 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 and, and we will lose our ability to see ones and zeros. But the good thing is, once the cruise stage is gone, there's another radio that will continue transmitting uh, a tone, so that, like like a flashlight, that will allow us to see at least see that the vehicle is still on. And that and, the, and that color of that flashlight tells us a little bit what the state this, the rover's in. But soon after that, um, it won't be very long before we'll be able to hear more ones and zeros coming from the spacecraft. Um, so this is a really exciting time, and, and it's just important to remind, remind people this is a, uh, there's a lot that can go wrong in a day like today. This, there are thousands of things that have to go right. Yeah, uh, we had success in the past landing on Mars. You'd think it gets easier, but it really doesn't. Why is it still so difficult? Well, it's, well, because it's involved thousands and thousands of things, hundreds of thousands of lines of code. We, there, there is uh, there's 79 pyrotechnic devices, each have to work perfectly one critical wire short or one key thing mechanism that doesn't work or breaks and it's mission over and so it's you know and and, and so and, and it's very easy we're human beings <laughs> we're not perfect mistakes can be made um we count on each other to to find uh, our own mistakes and we, and we uh, work very hard to to learn from the mistakes of the past um we've had many failures half remind people have, Roughly half, a little uh, like around half of the missions to Mars over history have failed. Wow! Um, and so it's 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 that could happen today too. Even though we've had a nice, wonderful string of successes in the United States, it's still a, 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 a still a bit of a gamble. A gamble that we we have hoped that we have we have erred in the side of luck, and 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 we've stacked the deck, uh, stacked the deck, and uh, uh, loaded the dice to make this thing succeed. Um, but um, if we do, if we do fail, and something bad happens today, I can tell you we're going to learn it. We'll have the data to tell us what happened. We'll know why. We'll figure it out. And and, and if if we are allowed, we will pick ourselves up and get us back on the horse. And if Congress and NASA allow, we will try again, as we always do. We will learn from our mistakes. And what are the possible scenarios we could be looking at today? Well, there's things, things like uh, uh, one of the key stressful elements for all of us is parachute inflation. Uh, but just even separating from the cruise stage is, is a pretty major event. Lots of devices have to work properly. Um, certainly, um, the heat shield separation, uh, getting, getting the, the descent engine started. There's no less than, than uh, uh, 16 ent rocket motors that have to work, uh, one to, uh, eight to control during entry, another eight to control it during landing. I, I said, it's a lot of stuff and it all has to work. And guess what? We haven't done this before with this vehicle ever. This is the first attempt to actually land. We can't, try it on, 
All right, I'm going to mute one more time uh, so that actually we have to bid uh, farewell to Buchin. She has to take off from our live stream today. Thank you so much for joining us. And we're really excited that you could be here and tell us a little bit about uh, the work that you're doing. So thank you again. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thanks again, Buchin. Cheers, cheers. So we had some really great questions in the chat, actually. Um, and I wanted to bring one up. So. Um, the um, on the NASA stream, they're just talking, of course, about risk and about this is the first time this kind of um, object has has actually gone to Mars, right? We're testing a whole new way of getting and landing on Mars. Um, and so Joanna has asked, uh, will any orbiters be capturing the landing? So I think it, I think she means capturing in terms of like um, visuals, right? Like not physically mm -hmm. capturing. Um, Shannon, can you tell us a little bit about what else is happening around Mars, but also why this landing is so particular and, and interesting? Yeah. So to answer Joanna's question, um, we won't. There will, won't be any orbiters that are like visually capturing the landing. Um, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter will help with the data relay to sort of confirm that the landing has, or hopefully, um, gone well. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, knock on all the wood. <laughs> um, the, uh, this landing, so the, the technology they're using for Perseverance is the same that they used for Mars Science Laboratory for Curiosity. So mm. Sky Crane, um, it's amazing technology. It's so audacious. And I, you know, anyone that's ever watched, I mean, Marva knows this, like anyone that knows anything about Sky Crane or landing anything on Mars on any planet, it's amazing that we've, that we've figured it out at all but like he just pointed out we've had a lot of failures i mean we sort of switched where nasa ended up trying lots of different things and started succeeding landing on mars um whereas like the soviets kept trying to land on mars and kept failing and then they went to venus and they did really well we kept failing so we kind of divided the line we got mars and they got venus um but we failed a lot landing on mars it's incredibly difficult i mean mm -hmm. this this capsule is coming in at thousands of miles per hour and then has to slow itself down and it has to be at just the right angle so it doesn't burn up, which is incredibly easy to do if you're coming in even just a little bit wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and then it has to continue not burning up. That shield has to keep working. And then parachute deploys, capsule keeps coming down, sky crane releases these long cables holding their, holding their one ton rover. And then it has to go from thousands of miles per hour to about two miles per hour, and then sets the giant, you know, SUV. Delicately <laughs> land, right? Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. So it's not new technology, but it's very risky technology. Yeah. Speaking of risk, Morba, I know you have a lot of thoughts and feelings about some of the risky parts of, of these missions. Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah. So, um, to me, it's it's a mixed bag, really. Um, it's mixed bag because I see, uh, you know, people in the aerospace industry, uh, maybe some of these new space companies that kind of like, oh, you know, we're really awesome. And look at all the stuff that we've developed. And we're so much better than what NASA has done and this, that or the other. And it's like, where did you think you learned that? It's like government retires risk so that these new companies have the opportunity to, to do all mm -hmm. this cool rocketry. And I think that um, NASA could actually do a lot more if the public were not so averse to the risk. It's like mm -hmm. exploration go, goes hand in hand with risk. And I think that uh, as a society, we've become more and more intolerant of failure. It's like, oh, that thing failed. I mean, you listen to what he just said, right? He's like, oh, if, if this thing doesn't work, we we hope, we hope that Congress and we hope that people will let us do it again. It's like, it shouldn't be about hoping that we can do it again. It's like, for sure, because or else the failure wasn't worth the failure. It's mm -hmm. like, you when you fail, that is the cost of exploration. And I think people just need to be calibrated and, and a bit educated on the fact that, yeah, this is risky. It's almost a miracle for stuff to work the risks are not blind risks. They're very mm -hmm. calculated. I remember being at JPL and going through so many thread tests and rehearsals. Like 
All the stuff that they're doing now, they've been through this. They've been through simulators. They've had all sorts of like anomalies pop up and how do you deal with that? It's like mm -hmm. the amount of work that goes into this to try to recover from any anomalies and still things may not work. But if they don't, that's what exploration is about. We got to embrace the fact that failures are going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, well, again, knocking on wood that we don't see any like catastrophic failures today, right? Because we want to see this thing land. I mean, see, we want to imagine this thing landing and hear from all of the different places that it has landed. So um, I actually have one question that I, I don't know the answer to. And I wonder if either of you do. Someone has asked, um, what's the significance of the jar of peanuts in Mission mm -hmm. Control? And someone else also wanted to know about that. I'm wondering if either of you have any insight, because I just think this is a really fun question. That's I was gonna go for you, Marva. Um, I don't. I know someone told me at one point the full history of why peanuts ended up in Mission Control. But since you've actually worked in Mission Control, if I maybe you know that. Well, so here's the thing, right? I mean, um, I probably you know got it wrong as well. But uh, basically, what I heard is that look, people were people uh, during one of these missions. Uh, somebody was just wanting to have something to gnaw on just to eliminate nerves, right? Mm. It was like, oh, you know, just something to calm the nerves down, something to kind of keep your mouth kind of occupied, chewing on something, and they just happen to have peanuts. But then, you know, it was a successful mission, and then it, like, became ritual. Okay, well, mm. it was successful, and everybody was eating peanuts, passing it around, so... Gotta let's, eat peanuts again. Let's, <laughs> let's continue to do that. Kind of like this... How, how, Without going into details, how some baseball players have their certain things for good luck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> totally, yeah. Well, that's fun. I love that. I'm I'm not a super super superstitious person, but I feel like if I were in that mission control uh, setting, I would definitely want everything to be the way it was if something went right. Right. Um, well, I I see that they NASA has just added their atmospheric entry countdown. So um, I am going to add our live stream back in and see how it's going. Is the atmosphere. The confirmation that the aircraft has turned to the desired entry attitude. We are about seven and a half minutes from entry interface. Okay, the vehicle is pointed in the right direction. The thrusters are warmed up and doing their job. And now we've spun down from two revolutions per minute that the vehicle had the whole way to, all the way to Mars. It's a spin stabilized spacecraft. And then from here on out, it's going to just be a bullet and can, can control its orient orientation and attitude via rockets on the back of the uh, back points shell. carrier lock. Uh, sorry, and we're the DTE from uh, Radio Science from uh, Green Bank reports carrier lock. You see the carrier on the downlink. Carrier lock is good. <laughs> Flight level one. Yeah, that's really cool. We are continuing to wait for entry interface. We're about six minutes and 45 seconds from entry interface. We have confirmation from uh, Greenback that they are receiving direct to Earth telemetry via that path. The spacecraft perseverance is currently transmitting heartbeat tones. These tones indicate that perseverance is operating normally and has nothing significant to report. Oh, that's great. Good. Everything's nominal. It's good. It's our, it's our vocab word of the day. Nominal. nominal. Nominal's good. This is what we want. Yeah, so we're still about uh, okay. 15 minutes away from landing, nominal. a little less. 3.55 is when they say that uh, Perseverance, or rather, t Mars 2020 will be landing Excuse with Perseverance on Mars. Yeah, it will be very quickly, which is the entry point. It it won't be very long before the, the, the atmosphere will start getting thicker and thicker. It's going very quickly at a, at a fairly steep angle of 15 degrees uh, into the atmosphere. And as it starts to slow we're down. just under uh, we're about five and a half minutes from entry interface. We're still receiving heartbeat tones. Uh, we expect to continue receiving heartbeat tones until about five minutes after entry. At that time, Perseverance will be no longer in view of our antennas here on Earth. About 90 seconds prior to entry, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter should begin receiving telemetry from Perseverance and streaming it to Earth in near real time. Uh, awesome. There are a few expected short outages, such as when we have a plasma back out or when we enter the peak heating 
phase, aside from these outages caused by the plasma blackout, antenna switching, or high dynamic event, spacecraft events, mm -hmm. we should have telemetry until about 90 seconds after landing. Uh, I'm going to just mute blackout. for one more moment because um, I wanted to, when Shannon, I wanted to ask you a question. So how long does it take for a mission to make it from an idea in some person's eye, a twinkle in their eye, to actually this moment right now where they're landing? I know that we still have like months and perhaps years of, of Mars 2020 and Perseverance on, on, the, um, on the planet, but how long is that time frame? What, what are we talking? Months, years, decades? Yeah, tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, it, um, every mission is sort of has to fit into what to NASA's decadal survey, which is sort of a plan for like, this is what we want to accomplish scientifically for the next 10 years. Um, some missions like Cassini, you know, were 30 years in the making. That was ground pattern. They take a very long time from you know, different iterations to planning, to budget, to approval, everything to the point that we before we enter orbit, land on a planet, it's easily decades. Um, sometimes it's quick, like 20 years, but <laughs> it, it takes a really, really long time and thousands of people and usually over many different countries and this mission is no exception. You know, you're seeing, we're seeing mission control right now um, connected to the Deep Space Network, but there's lots of other rooms at JPL jammed with people. There's lots of people in their homes right now because of COVID who are operating, running mission control. Wow. People at, you know, they mentioned Green Bay, that's in, in Virginia. So um, everyone at the Deep Space Network at three different centers right now, they're in Spain is going to be in charge of handing over the confirmed telemetry of Drum and the rover. But it takes thousands of people and, and decades to just have these this moment go well. It's it's a feat. I mean, that's why JPL's motto is dare mighty things for a reason, you know? It's, yeah. It's amazing. Absolutely. Um, we have another really great question from Joanna who asks, um, there's always so many people in mission control. What are they all doing? Are, are there redundancies so that someone faints or someone has an issue where they, they need to go? Um, do we, yeah, what, what, um, Morba, can you tell us a little bit about some of the people we might be seeing here you know, seated and helping making this thing happen? Yeah, so usually mission control, um, Aside, aside from, uh, you know, it, way, way, usually way in the back, you'll have the managers, mission managers, kind of the, the leadership of NASA and that sort of stuff present. Uh, also with their peanuts and, 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 and getting through the nervousness, right? But then usually each team, uh, you know, of the subsystems has a presence at a console there just so that they can basically uh, uh, monitor and respond to people near real time. I think the thing that people don't realize, and I think, you know, just like what Shannon said is, I know some of my fellow navigators, one of them is actually in Cedar Park, Texas, just a few miles from me, and he's been operating stuff, you know, remotely over the internet. And um, when I was at JPL, there's something called uh, a COOP, a continuity of operations kind of thing. And uh, Lockheed Martin has, and Littleton, has a lot of the, uh, the consoles and stuff that you see there at JPL. And so, there's always this backup. It's like if something happens at, at JPL, there's this other facility with another mission control that is basically in lockstep and getting the same signals from the deep space network and all this stuff. So, yes, there is redundancy. And, and uh, like Shannon said, they're, they're, the mansion has many rooms and you're just seeing but one of them. Amazing. Yeah. All right, I'm going to bring us back. We've got yeah, about a minute, minute before we're I'm entering the atmosphere here. So I'm going to bring us back to the live stream and uh, take a look at what's happening. MROs are in receive mode. We have confirmation that the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter is now relaying data from Perseverance. We're about 30 seconds from entry interface. So, so, so this, this to me is amazing because my last mission was MRO. Love MRO. Big, wouldn't be nowhere without MRO. About seconds from entry interface. 5.3 kilometers per second and an altitude of uh, 
of 150 kilometers from the surface of Mars. That silence is palatable. <laughs> oh, yeah. We have confirmation of entry interface. Perseverance is currently going 5.3 kilometers per second at an altitude of about 120 kilometers from the surface of Mars. So this is where the spacecraft nav team is like. Mm -hmm. the hand, yeah. It's over. <laughs> it's over. Too late That's now. awesome. It's now waiting until it begins feeling the atmosphere of Mars slow it down. Once there is enough atmosphere, it will start controlling its path to the landing target. So NASA is still controlling right now, is that right? Or do they actually have their hands? No, no, no. Field? Yeah. So what I'm just saying is that it's just a different team. Like the EDL team is from interface all the way down pretty much. I think it's good also for people to know that they issued the last command to the spacecraft two days ago. So its fate is already sealed. They're just getting telemetry back to know you're doing this right, you did this right, you did this right. And like, so it's great. It's fun, yeah. Nominal. We were probably seeing Nominal. There, there you go. There you go. <laughs> the vehicle should be doing its turns right now. Hammer has lost lock. Perseverance. We have indications that Perseverance is now performing bank reversals in the atmosphere. These are the steps in order to control its distance to the landing target. Uh, Perseverance has just passed through the point of maximum deceleration and has indicated that it felt approximately 10 Earth Gs of deceleration. Wow. Nice. That'll be tough. Person. 10 yeah. Gs is the maximum human can take. That's tough. <laughs> we saw a small outage uh, of the UHF telemetry from Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter during that peak heating phase likely caused by the plasma blackout. Perseverance is still continuing to perform bank reversals in the atmosphere to control its distance to the landing target. <laughs> Shannon, you look nervous. <laughs> so nervous. <laughs> this is my, my third EDL. And it's exciting. It's scary. More about what's going through your mind at this moment. Well, I mean, it's it's kind of like what I was saying before. What they're seeing is stuff that's happened 11 some odd minutes ago, right? So when they're getting the readings, it's like, yeah. We have entered heading alignment, which means Perseverance is no longer trying to control the distance to Mars, but in to the target on Mars, but instead is flying straight to the target. Wow. Crater. The crater, former lake, right? That Jezero means the former Delta. lake. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very cool. velocity is about 500 oh. and 50 meters per second at an altitude of about 15 kilometers from the surface. Wow, close. close. That happened fast. Three minutes. Oh, yeah. Minutes. We are coming upon the straighten up. We are starting the straighten up and fly right maneuver where the spacecraft will jettison the entry balance masses in preparation for parachute deploy and to roll over to give the radar a better look at the ground. Yes. The navigation has confirmed that the parachute has yes. deployed and we're seeing significant deceleration. Oh, so cool. Velocity. Our current velocity is 430 meters per second at an altitude of about 12 kilometers from the surface of Mars. Nice. Wow. God, that moment of jubilation you hear from like one person confirming it first, that's very cool. Yeah, you, you definitely need those parachutes. Yeah. The now slowed to subsonic speeds and the heat shield has been separated. This allows both the radar and the cameras to get their first look at the surface. Current velocity is 145 meters per second and an altitude of about 10 nine and a half kilometers above the surface. All right, we're getting there. 
We are good at this. Yeah, you, yes. yes. We are good at this. I should hope so. I really hope so. <laughs> We've done it. We've done it a couple times, right? I mean, this is the fourth rover in the last 20 years. Am I, am I remember? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. First turn now has radar lock on the ground. Current yeah. intensity is about 100 meters per second, 6.6 kilometers of the circuit. Right. Perseverance is continuing to descend on the parachute. We are coming up on the initialization of terrain relative navigation and subsequently the priming of the landing engines. Our current velocity is about 90 meters per second at an altitude of 4.2 kilometers. Wow. All right, if you've got fingers left to cross, now is a great time. Yeah. There's confirmation that the lander vision system has produced a valid solution and part of terrain relative navigation. Yeah. Yeah. We have timing of the landing engine. All right, we're just Our about there. Is 83 meters per second at about 2.6 kilometers from the surface of Mars. We have confirmation that the back shell has separated. Oh. We are currently performing the divert maneuver. Current velocity is about 75 meters per second at an altitude of about a kilometer off the surface of Mars. Here in safety, Bravo. We have completed our terrain relative navigation. Current speed is about 30 meters per second, altitude of about 300 meters off the surface of Mars. Wow. Oh. We're close. We're getting there. Mm -hmm. We have started our constant velocity accordion, which means we are conducting the sky crane, about to conduct the sky crane maneuver. We've lost director at two tones. As expected. <laughs> As expected. It's a good note. The maneuver has started. Wow. Imagine. Meters off the surface. Sky crane, everybody. We're getting signals from tomorrow. You is good. Touchdown confirmed. Yeah. Wow, wow. Awesome, awesome. Congratulations. Oh, so exciting. Oh the stage has flown away to safe distance. Perseverance is continuing to transmit oh my God. through Mars upon orbiter to Earth. Good job, everybody. Oh, that's so exciting. I got to tell you, Alan Chen right now is like... He can sleep now. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, oh. Oh, of course, they're still getting telemetry from the lander. This is so exciting. Thumbnails are next. All right, I'll see you. Wow, you got it. This is so exciting. I, the team is beside themselves. It's, oh, it's, it's so surreal. Uh, Stay tuned. We might get some pictures. That yeah. would be cool. <laughs> oh, yeah. Everybody's, everybody's going to be waiting for we those pictures. There's two cameras below the rover that'll take the pictures. That's awesome. And we'll get them back within 11 minutes. Good. Gosh, that's so cool. He's been riding on this. There are so many people yeah, celebrating. <laughs> Look at all these. Is alive on the surface of Mars. Oh. It's not uh, not but we have seen the completion of EDL 3000. Copy activity. That is as expected. Emerald is still seeing a strong signal from the lander. Awesome. Awesome. Is there a chance that some of the communication stuff would be damaged in the in the descent or in the landing? Is that possible? It could, but for, for this landing, they, what they do is they have the rover 
surface of Mars. Congratulations to the we'll mission. We have to directly communicate with the Deep Space Network when we have an dropout below the horizon. Like, tomorrow. Uh, so. uh, oh, here we go. I have uh, the target point on the map when you are ready. Oh, we are all right. Ready. Let's all watch this. Go for it. Flight, I'll be uh, moving in, showing you the safe zone that we've landed in. Wow. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> All right. Amazing. From Perseverance on the surface of Mars. Now, it comes from the engineering cameras known as the hazard camera. Uh, this camera is mainly used to help the rover drive safely around Mars, and we will get higher resolution photos later in the day. So cool. That's oh awesome. my God. All I, know, uh, all I know is that when NASA does this stuff, I got to tell you that they do it in style. They know how to do this stuff. It's good. It's good. Wow. Yeah. All of that looks so amazing. Yeah. Wow. They must be in just fantastic moods. And they did all this during a pandemic. That's right. Yeah, actually, let's take a moment and just talk a little bit about some of the challenges. They were talking about this during the live stream as well for NASA, but Shannon, what are some of the challenges of, I mean, besides the fact that some of these people literally right now helping make this happen are at home doing this work from their you know, offices or kitchen counters. What other challenges did they face trying to make this happen during a pandemic? Yeah, well, it complicated. Um, I mean, obviously, they did this perfectly, despite the pandemic. Um, but it, it changed uh, how they prepped for to move the spacecraft at Cape Canaveral. It changed how many people, like, no one's really been on lab at JPL for almost the last year. Mm -hmm. We've been driving, I mean, we've been driving rovers from people's living rooms. Yeah. And, and that is amazing in and of itself, but more images. Okay, so this these these we have a camera in the front and out rear of the of the, of the spacecraft. Uh it's uh it's it's they're near the ground, so these are pretty close. Oh. Sorry about that, friends. We've got uh, glass covers over these these cameras. But uh, we took these seconds after landing, so so there's still dust in the air from our landing event. Uh, so this is this is happening. Um, uh, you know, this happened just seconds ago. Just arrived. Wow. And uh, this is really amazing. And, and uh, we even know where we landed. This is the most amazing thing. The vehicle has told us where where it's landed because it figured it out. You know, this is a sign. NASA works. NASA works. And we put our arms together and our hands together and our brains together. We can succeed. This yep. is what NASA does. This is what we can do as a country on all of the problems yep. we, we have. Yep. We need to work together to do these kinds of things and make success happen. So amazing. All the geologists right now are losing their minds. Oh, yeah, they must be. And joining us now is the acting administrator of NASA, Steve Jurisic. Steve, welcome and congratulations. <laughs> Steve. Hey, thank you. What an amazing day. It, how does it feel to have another rover on Mars? Uh, it, it's amazing um, uh, to have Perseverance join Curiosity on Mars. And what, a, what a, just a credit to the team. I mean, just what an amazing team um, to work through all the adversity um, that goes and all the challenges that go with landing a rover on Mars, plus the challenges of COVID and um, and just an amazing accomplishment. And what does this mean for NASA and its future plans? So for robotic exploration, you know, every time we um, execute a mission with new instruments, we discover new things and things we never thought we would discover. So that's that always informs our future robotic missions. Uh, both mm -hmm. landers, rovers, and orbiters. Um, this mission also has technology on it. One of the cool things is the Ingenuity helicopter. Um, it's, a, it's an experiment on this mission, 
But if it's successful, we can use it as an observation, science observation platform by putting instruments on it and also use it as a scout. Um, for yeah, like a drone, for, for sure. And, uh, and then just the entry, set, and landing um, capability. Um, it'll allow us to land more and more larger, more ambitious robots on the surface of Mars. And then for UN exploration, um, we have the Medley, Med, uh, Mars Entry, set, and Landing Instrumentation, which is going to give us EDL information. Um, we have the Mars Environmental Dynamics Analyzer. It's going to give us uh, properties, size and properties of dust particles, because when, when we send people, we're going to have to deal with that dust. Um, and uh, just, it's just, this is just an incredible mission because of the science and the technology and then caching samples for a Mars sample return mission. That will be a, an amazing mission, the first round trip to Mars and back, and bringing those samples cached by Perseverance back to Earth to examine with state-of-the-art um, equipment in our laboratories here on Earth. We have yep. to pause so one more time, actually. Go ahead, to... go ahead, Marba. I was just going to say that, you know, this is the sort of stuff that we need to do to extend humanity's expiration date. That's, mm -hmm. that, that's, that's just the reality of it. We need to be successful at being able to live on places that are not Earth, and and so this is a requirement. Yeah, um, I actually someone mentioned the helicopter in the chat, and so I want to take this moment to actually show a very quick video of how it's actually going to get onto Mars. This is this was um, shared by NASA um, earlier on their website, so I'm just going to play it now. And that can help gener uh, de you know, uh, generate breathable oxygen and even liquefy oxidizer for propulsion systems. So that's a tech demo on Perseverance. And then we're going to continue to characterize the frozen water on and below the surface of Mars and eventually try yes. to figure out how to extract that water from the Martian soil, or we call regolith. And then we can use that for potable water and also break it down into oxygen and hydrogen for rocket fuel. So absolutely, we're going to try to eventually figure out how to live I just the love that video because it really shows the incredibly complex ways they have to do things in order to just and drop something from a rover to to the planet, Mars. right? Um, the helicopter's name is rover. Ingenuity, um, and they're gonna it's gonna go on really short flights, like thirty, Jessica like sixty this to ninety seconds or so. Um, why send a helicopter to Mars? What are, what are we gonna learn yes, by sending a helicopter to Mars? Shannon, do you have so any insight? Yeah. Well, um, this is this one in particular is a technology. Can we actually fly on Mars? But if we're moving into the future and we have uh, drugs on Mars with taking us, out with water, you know, look at terrain, um, help us, you know, plan on this where we're going to drive, actually make scientific discoveries because these rovers are drive very slowly. This is a really efficient way to get around. We'll be looking at the rovers here. So you know, that, the uh, is, is, is the water, is the salt going on. It, it's a really work. efficient way to explore. So if this and technology this works, all in time we got to send some regularly scheduled communications and, path, and which happens in the what's going on. And so we will yeah, be that would be really cool. Um, actually, someone asked sure a really great that, question in the uh, chat. Um, what happened to the and, sky uh, crane after it dropped the payload? What? So that it was floating, so it was you know, hovering in the air, it dropped down the uh, rover. It's what happens a, now? It's a little bit like this is one of my favorite things about you know, sky crane is your time they programmed zone. it so it flies uh, over, uh, you know, just really uh, uh, location, fires the thrusters, drops the spacecraft, and speeds out in another direction so it gets nowhere near the rover. So the thrusters keep firing, but they fire in another direction. So it's it'll be it'll be away from everything. And, uh, and, some, uh, some and it's just oh, something nights, on Mars at this we're point. Also yep. and, yeah. Know, we, uh, All right, we're gonna let's go check back in lifestyle. with the um, <laughs> with the live stream and see what's going on. We might have gotten more photos for you. This is Sophia's video. Hi, my name is Sophia Lopez, and my question for NASA is: How's Perseverance gonna survive? And here's a drawing that I made from Perseverance, oh. thinking about Earth. So Thank good. You. 
Well, Sophia, Perseverance survives um, with a power source um, that charges its batteries uh, overnight while it sleeps, and it keeps heaters uh, on so that all of our critical electronics can stay warm, um, as well as our mechanism. But it's really uh, survived by the team um, that performs the health and safety assessments every day and communicates with the rover um, and makes sure that uh, she's, she's doing okay. Well, thanks for your time, Jessica, and good luck living on Mars time. Thank you. To be fun. <laughs> Let's head back to Marina as she gives us a sneak peek into the future at JPL. Thanks so much, Raquel. It's definitely bustling behind me. Uh, it is not quiet like it was just 20 minutes ago. And congrats to the whole team. What an amazing accomplishment. Mike Watkins is the director of NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He was the mission manager during the Curiosity rover landing on Mars. Welcome, Mike. Oh, thanks. Glad to, glad to be here. You can see all my mask markings on. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were just celebrating, and rightly so. Now, you've been around for a number of Mars landings. What makes this one special? Well, you know, two things. I mean, it's the biggest and best rover we've ever sent to Mars, um, and, and it can really, you know, do amazing things in terms of, uh, you know, its own scientific exploration of this habitable environment, you know, at Jezero. Um, but, you know, it's also, as, as, as you've heard today, you know, it's the first step in Mars sample return. So really, you know, it's, it's not only doing its own mission, it's setting us up for a series of missions and to bring those samples back. And, you know, a lot of the effort to develop the rover uh, was specifically designed, you know, for that sampling and caching system. It's one of the most complex robotic systems ever made. And, uh, you know, having it down safely means Mars sample return continues right on course and, and, uh, and, and we are moving forward. Wonderful. Now, JPL has a long... Mike was my boss, by the way. Exploration. Why do you think it's so important to continue to push those boundaries? You, you know, there's a lot of reasons. I mean, obviously, it, you know, for, for places that are far away, like Mars, and even farther away, uh, you know, like Europa, uh, right now, robots are the, robotic exploration is the only way we can uh, make these scientific discoveries and really understand these early... Uh, habitable environments. In the case of Europa, maybe it's even still habitable. And, uh, you know, we're not ready to, to, to go there with astronauts yet, uh, but the robots are ready to go there. And so we always, uh, you know, are forerunners and pathfinders um, of, of, of human exploration. And we start by sending, you know, our eyes and, and arms there in the form of a robot. And um, it is just fantastic to be able to do that and to learn from each rover, learn from the science and the engineering and make the next one better and make more and more discoveries. And every time we do one of these missions, we make fabulous discoveries. And, uh, and you know, each one is, is more exciting uh, than the last. The future does look exciting. Now, as director of JPL, what would you like to I'm going to pause the stream one more time, right actually, because um, I, oh, yeah. I think they, they um, I'm going to invite people, people if they want to keep they, watching the NASA uh, live stream to you know, go to their YouTube page where they're going to continue this coverage for probably another and, and, 30 you know, to 40 minutes, and then they're going to do a debrief around 530. So the best place to find all of the NASA Perseverance Mars 2020 information is going to be there. So we just put that link in the chat if you want to keep chatting with them. But before we're, we're going to wrap up our live stream soon, but I, before we do that, um, Shannon and I and Morba, I want to just, um, first of all, thank you so much for being here. This is an incredibly historic moment and to be here with both of you is was so exciting and really, really fabulous. So thank you for that. But I wanted to just ask you um, if people think that are watching today, if people want to get involved either with space travel or astrophysics or science writing or anything in between, what advice do you have for those people watching today? Shannon, why don't you go first? Um, as someone that has no background in science or uh, you know had, did not have this career as a plan, um, I think write, read a lot. Um, and follow, it's as cheesy as this sounds, whatever you're fascinated by and you can't stop thinking about and you just want to ask everyone about, go there. Keep doing that. Keep learning things and um, talk to people who are experts and, and really have fun. That's, it's the best job ever. Awesome. Thank you so much. Maribel, what about you? Yeah, so... Um, look, throughout my own trajectory, pun intended, um, lots of people said no to me all the time. And I think one of the things that I started this whole thing by being a security guard guarding nuclear missiles in Montana. That's how my journey started. It's like, yep, I was a cop 
enlisted in the U.S. Air Force. Montana has really dark skies. I saw dots of light going across the sky during my night shifts. They weren't meteors. They weren't planes. It was stuff that humans had put around, uh, you know, Earth orbit. And that piqued my curiosity. And I'm like, you know, I want to know more about that. And people kept on saying, you're not smart enough. It's not your thing. You're, you're just a cop. You're just a security guard. You're just the blah, blah, blah. And so I guess my main message to folks is don't let other people's opinion become your reality. Don't let other people's opinion become your reality. You are pretty much in control of your reality to a great extent. And uh, look, the path may be very hard, may be extremely difficult, and it's, it's not going to be fair. The path that other people take may seem much easier, much this. Don't compare yourself to others. Just know that you have your own journey, whatever it is, be committed to it. And one of the things that I tell people is be courageous. And uh, my own personal definition of courage is courage is the absence of paralysis in the presence of fear. And I tell people I'm not fearless. I'm afraid of a lot of stuff. I fear stuff all the time, but I just don't let the fear prevent me from doing things that, you know, I, I have an inner clarion call to do. And so that's what that's what I would tell people. I love that. Yeah. And like JPL says, right, they are mighty things. Yeah. Thank you all. Again, thank you so much for being here. This was a fantastic experience to have with you. Um, thank you so much for our audience for choosing us to watch the live stream with. You could have done it in so many different places and we really appreciate you choosing Science Friday. So uh, it, it was just a pleasure to do this. So have a wonderful day wherever you are and uh, we'll see you again soon. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you.